So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we best get started because we've got lots to uh, cover today. Um, welcome to another Friday webinar by the Land App. Today, we're really focusing on digital ecosystems um, and how you can build them in the Land App. As always, just a reminder that uh, you are on a webinar, so your microphones will remain muted throughout. Um, we will be uh, hosting a bit of a Q&A session towards the end, um, and so please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And in particular today, we really want to pose a couple of questions around uh, what are the blockers to you achieving your, your goals? What do you think could help speed up what you're currently delivering, or is there any other ideas you may have? And, and that's not just around the land app solely, but you know, the wider current climate as well. So a bit of an agenda for today. Um, obviously, we'd like to do a bit of welcome and housekeeping at the start, um, and then we're going to uh, really be diving into these concepts of digital ecosystems. Um, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes going through some slides, understanding both what is a digital ecosystem, what are they comprised of, and how we have some solutions in the geospatial space, space for building these ecosystems. Included in that, we are going to touch on obviously the value of ecologists and the human element to this work, because we are fully aware that, you know, it's not just the technology that's going to deliver the next stage, we absolutely need as many people on the ground as well. Once we've gone through those slides, I'm then going to do a bit of a demo, understanding how you can create a digital twin, and a digital twin is the components that make up that digital ecosystem. So I'm going to discuss just what you need as an individual, how it looks on the land app, how it feels. Um, both through creating baselines and land management plans. Um, and then finally, just going to demonstrate a couple of both um, existing functions of the land app, but also some new functionality that's going to be released fairly soon around building that ecosystem. Um, and within that, um, the components um, being the plans, the flows within that ecosystem being, you know, the data sharing through Map of Maps and our API service and then the outputs as well, which um, is going to be a new digital dashboard that will hopefully be released just after Christmas, but is up for testing right now. As mentioned, Q&A function, please do let us know what you're finding difficult, what are your bro uh, blockers. We are quite keen for that Q&A to be as uh, uh, frank and open as possible. Um, I will also, towards the end as well, just do a bit of promotion for our upcoming mobile app. Um, it's actually out at, um, in January, but we're going through some beta testing at the moment. Uh, a number of you have expressed interest in doing the beta testing, um, and I think we've got quite a full list, um, but we'll be at least um, touching on that towards the end of the demo. Um, before I get started, just want to quickly introduce myself as well. So I'm Dan, I'm the Head of Innovation at LandApp. Um, I've been with the, with the tool for the last two years. Um, background about myself, I did study, I studied zoology at uni, uh, I was at Cardiff, where we did both ecological and zoological modules, um, and then after finishing at uni, I, I was fortunate enough to go and work at FWAG Southwest, so the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, where I um, was really helping farms go through countryside stewardship basic payment, involved in environmental land management uh, trials, as well as going through my basis uh, qualification as well in environmental advice. Um, so passionate conservationist, but really trying to use technology to catalyze this next phase, this nature recovery that we all so want to see. So we're starting at the, uh, the challenge and potentially hinting at towards a solution. So everyone on this call is fully aware that we're facing a huge challenge at the moment. We've got ecological collapse, we've got climate change, um, and we've got all these moving parts and loads of noise, and it, it can feel quite daunting. Um, but we're really trying to build some solutions that can hopefully give a bit of a leading light and understand how everyone can play a role in these next steps. Um, alongside that big, those big challenges, we're also in a, a massive, you know, a massive digital revolution as well. There's so much great technology that's being built. You know, I'm not just talking about the land app, just the amount of calls I'm on with new people de de developing artificial intelligence, satellite data, et cetera. And it, you know, it's really down to us as a collective to try and harness this for good to deliver for the planet. And we fundamentally believe that, you know, using this technology on our side, we can drive forward environmental recovery. Um, you know, we can empower everyone here with data analytics, geospatial mapping tools, and of course that smart AI that I just mentioned, but absolutely uh, it's paramount that we engage you, the people on the ground, the people that are delivering the advice, are delivering those surveys as well. So it's really up to us to work with you 
um, to hopefully make your, your job more efficient, more effective, um, delivering those environmental enhancements we want to see on the ground. So I'm hoping I can take you the next you know, half an hour on a bit of a journey on how we see our, our role in helping you deliver your, your role. As a collective, you know, if we use digital technology, we can better engage and inspire landowners. Fundamentally, we need to work with landowners and land managers if we're going to deliver, you know, ecological restoration, etc. But it's not just about those land managers. We want to engage companies and NGOs and individuals and in communities, school groups, etc., in in uh, adopting environmentally friendly practices, but also pushing at policy level and business levels as well. Um, we also are working on a number of ELMS trials and looking at the funding mechanisms. I'm not really going to touch on that today, but I do fundamentally believe um, that geospatial data is going to underpin a fair and diverse funding stream for the future, whether that is ELMS or you know, biodiversity offsetting or you know, these carbon markets that are upcoming as well. And we're hopeful that platforms like LandApp, you know, not just us, but platforms like us as well, provide as little blocker as possible so everyone can be involved. And we're fully aware that technology can be quite daunting at times, um, but we're really here to try and provide that support for you to benefit from digital technologies. Um, and ultimately create this digital ecosystem that we're trying to promote. Um, and the high level point is if we can electronically represent what's currently happening on the ground, e.g. the current habitats, where they are in relation to one another, and the proposed future of what could happen in that space, we start to catalyze this market, we start to catalyze this movement towards effective planning, effective funding, effective evidencing of ecological restoration. So what is a digital ecosystem? It might be a bit of jargon, but I'm hoping by the end of this call, you can at least uh, relate to it and it, it, it feels like something tangible that you can you can get on board with as well. So I'm just going to spend a couple of moments understanding, try to explain what it means and um, how best practice, e.g. how do you um, make sure that the, all the different components of that ecosystem are healthy, because obviously to, to keep the... Um, the, um, the simile going, uh, the, you know, the, he the health of the maps, the health of the data is going to ultimately maintain the health of the ecosystem itself. So the components of a digital ecosystem are what we refer to as a digital twin. Uh, a digital twin is a replica of what's currently happening within a, a management unit. So that could be a farm, an estate, a nature reserve, is what two-dimensional habitats are there what three-dimensional habitats are there, and what, what are the subsequent values that those habitats are providing. So it might be a, a, you know, an arable field that's got barley in, that's producing the food. You've also got the buffers around the outside, and you've got your woodland and your wetlands and your ponds, et cetera. So a digital twin is just a digital representation of what's currently on the ground. Um, and it's, it's built within that idea of a baseline, a baseline habitat assessment, um, if you're doing your biodiversity offsetting, for example. When these digital twins are done right, they fit into a wider framework that we are now uh, uh, calling that digital ecosystem. And that framework, we hope, will start to catalyze this next phase of growth, nature recovery, etc. So your baseline at the top of the, uh, the, the framework is what you currently have and the derived values of those things. On top of that digital twin, you can also start drawing up scenarios. What should you do next or what should your client do next, e.g. should I could plant a hedgerow here, I could plant a woodland there, I could try cover crops over there. Over there. That management plan and that baseline are the two main components that then allow you to collaborate. And that collaboration both is a one-to-one -one me with my advisor, I'm inviting it, you know, my ecological advisor in or a, a land agent to come collaborate with me, with me on my private map and collaborate in a more open sense with your neighbours. Here is where I'm thinking, neighbour, that I want to plant my wildflower meadow. Can you um, continue that wildflower meadow through your management holding as well? And ultimately, these three building blocks, the baseline, the management plan and the collaboration, we foresee underpinning funding. And we're already seeing that through the schemes such as the biodiversity offsetting, nutrient neutrality. And we're hoping that ELMS uh, and local nature recovery and landscape restoration fundamentally is underpinned by this process, this geospatial underpinning of the digital ecosystem. If we can get people going around this virtuous loop, the amount of strategy and insight we can derive is, is quite massive. And that's at both level. At the individual level, am I on target as a farmer or as a 
uh, you know, a nature reserve manager to meet my targets, but also at, at the higher level, uh, whether it's local councils or you know, government, are we on track to meet our targets under the 25 year environment plan or you know, the, the nature recovery uh, network uh, ambitions as well. But obviously we can't do this alone. You know, this isn't just something that technology can do. Technology is just a catalyst for it, but we fundamentally need to do this together. You know, there's so many great professionals out there. All we want to do is try and streamline your work and make sure that you're all doing it in a cohesive way. And hence why we're pushing this digital framework. Just a good thing, a good way to think about what we're doing is we're trying to make the components that make up the ecosystem as clean and as healthy as possible and try and make it as easy for that data to flow between partners, between stakeholders to try and facilitate this um, process. You don't need me to tell you the roles of ecologists, but just to recap, we put uh, Tom, my colleague, is on the call, put five key things that ecologists can really help with. Obviously, it's on site monitoring and ground truthing. Getting out on the ground is so important. You know, you can do a lot from space, you can do a lot from remote sensing, but fundamentally, we still need people to go and ground truth and check that that's correct. Um, building local knowledge uh, into the plans is, is really key. And at the moment, it's still quite difficult to tie in automatically, but understanding the local relevance of a site is a massive role for the ecologists. Identification of key stakeholders as well, so streamlining and distributing funding, for example, from key stakeholders um, is, is critical. Uh, relationship management, you know, if you're a facilitator, for example, you're building relationships between landowners, um, you know, if you're an ecologist, you're building relationships potentially between local businesses and land, etc. And then the far, final one, which um, is quite close, close to us, is being that key person or you know, organisation that can help avoid leaving people behind you know in this world of digital tech it can be quite daunting for people and not everyone has a skill set or the access to the digital realm and we fundamentally believe that ecologists and facilitators and you know farm advisors are going to play a critical role in making sure that nobody and the land that they represent is left behind so so the next 30 minutes i'm just going to spend a bit of time talking about how you can create a digital twin on land app and a couple of new functionalities that we're hopefully going to release soon and then how that digital twin fits into the wider um, digital ecosystem that we're trying to create hopefully that was a slick transition from one slide to the other um, so just to recap, I think most of you on the call are fairly, hopefully familiar with the Land App, but just a quick high level point is we are a web based mapping platform found on the land um, You can come and register for free. Um, we've got, you know, thousands of users using us um, and using our free platform to you know, deliver their objectives, but we also do have a, a subscription service as well for the, the professionals and those working at that at that wider scale. So for today's demo, I will be starting using the free product, but it will transition into uh, uh, demonstrating some of the premium functions that you find within the subscription tiers as well. Um, but for those that haven't got an account, I'd highly recommend come in, join for free, have a play, and um, hopefully you'll start to see the value of the tool as well. So I'm going to start by creating a new map. Um, once you create an account, um, you will automatically be dropped on a map, but for those that have already been um, using the Land app, um, you can create a new map by hitting the new button um, at the top right hand side and hit create. That then plonks you, so to speak, on an interactive base map that can be changed um, from a number of our providers. Just be aware that some of them are premium, but um, please see previous webinar if you're interested in learning more about the, the different um, mapping services that we can offer. But for today's demo, I'm probably going to spend most of it on satellite because it gives you quite a nice um, image of what's currently happening on the ground. Um, the first step to building a digital twin is by defining a boundary. Um, and you can define a boundary in a number of ways. And I'm just going to show you, especially because we've got this new um, left hand panel for any of us, any of you that have been with us for at least over a month. Um, but if you hit this new button, you can work through a series of steps to get your boundary. The common one is if you just go for the use template um, and you can choose if you are, for example, using an SBI number, which would be my first demo, um, going straight into a basic payment scheme. Um, from here, you're then asked to um, select which uh, import methods you want. I'm just going to first demo the import from rural payment agency. Um, if you are a farm or representing a farm. To do this, you need a single business identifier, which is a nine digit 
number that allows you to request data directly from the Royal Payment Agency. The data that you can request is land covers, land parcels and, land parcels and hedgerows, um, but I'm just going to, for this uh, demo, just bring down land covers and hedges. Hit next. That then sends a request to the Royal Payment Agency to double check you've got data associated to that um, SBI number. Um, once it's then confirmed it, it then allows you to give the plan a name, hit finish, and that should download your data onto your map. So the reason I'm showing SBI first is because I still believe it's one, of, it's one of the quickest ways at present to get a nice land cover or a digital twin for your client. But I will show you in a moment how you can do that workflow without an SBI number. But by choosing basic payment, what it has done is it's, it's um, dropped those shapes into the right location, but also it's assigned them a basic payment code. Just as a note, any areas that are deemed arable land, um, such as this field parcel here, um, are just called arable land, but aren't given a code because the RPA um, is always, you know, almost 12 months behind with the basic payment declaration. Um, so you can quickly assign a code by hitting the change button, choosing from our drop-down list and assigning it to a, a code. Um, for this demo, I'm actually just going to focus on this one field. I'm going to create a digital twin of what's happening within here um, because there's quite a lot of cool stuff I want to show you and um, time is um, tight. However, as a note, we've got loads of training resources. If you want a bit more of a detailed understanding of how to create a basic payment project, for example, do just go into the help and guidance button at the bottom right hand side and search for basic payment or country social stewardship and you should be able to find at least a, a link to some guidance, if not a full webinar that you can watch a recording of. So I'm just going to quickly show you creating a digital twin using the basic payment project to start with. This is obviously for farmland, but it does have some value afterwards because you can directly translate your basic payment into the language that we're pushing for your digital twin, which is the UK habitat classification. Um, so easy drawing tools are built into the land app. Um, the first obvious one is that actually this field is, is two field parcels. Um, and you can see that there's a footpath that runs down the, the middle. Um, you can split polygons by right clicking, choosing the split tool and then clicking once outside of the polygon and then creating a line and double clicking twice or double clicking outside the other side of the polygon. And that creates a straight line split, but the data contained within those polygons has remained consistent. So the field parcel ID, for example, 2286 is contained within both of those polygons. These polygons, however, can be treated as independent. So for example, I can say that this is a different crop type, um, such as a cover crop down here, um, and the lucerne is just in the top, um, just so it allows you to kind of increase the resolution of those, um, those data fields. Actually, in reality, this is, this is all in lucerne at the moment. The other thing that I may want to map out within here is you can see actually there's a there's a rough brackeny woodland corridor that goes down this western side. And so what you can do is you can select your field parcel um, to draw a single line buffer and choose to draw a line. Um, and this line will automatically magnetize to the edge of my polygon. So you can see it's picking it up as, a, as soon as I go nearby. So I'm just going to do it for this first bit to start with. That's drawn a red line. When you hit finish, you can see where it is. And then just to that red line, I'm gonna add a buffer. So I'm gonna add um, a buffer of about three meters to the interior edge of this field to represent my bracken and woodland strip that's going around the outside of my uh, arable field. In this form, you can um, hit the subtract button straight away. I'm not going to for a particular reason, but by subtracting it, the buffer is then just removed from the, the main area of this Lucerne field. I'll come back to that in a moment. What I do want to do, though, is click the rounded corners button, because what that does is that just makes the edge of this field. So you can see there's quite a sharp corner in this red line here. It just smoothens it out. It makes it a bit more natural. Yeah, so I'm not going to push subtract now. And the reason for that is, is I just want to double check that the corner of this field is mapped correctly. So you can see that if I were to subtract that, I would also be subtracting from this polygon as well, uh, which I don't want to do. And so this, this comes back to the health of the, the, the digital twin is we want to really train you up um, to try and 
be confident that you're creating some accurate clean maps and we're hoping we provide you with all the tools you need to do that so in this scenario what i would do is i would drop first a vertex here just to mark just to make sure that point stays put and then i would bring this layer down to then make it flush with that that buffer strip um, so you could just bring that down another little little tip actually is if you click on this one you can actually just subtract subtract that one and that should then make this bit flush as well yeah so you can see that it's done pretty much the same thing either man you to do it or um or not and then yeah once i've got this as an area i can assign it the code so on basic payment this is an ineligible area um for example because it's it's non-agricultural but then i also just need to remember to subtract so I'm just using just using the basic payment template at the moment. I will transfer it into UK Hub in, in, a, in, a, in a matter of moments, but I just wanted to just demonstrate this on the basic payment template. So just to recap on that, I hit draw, chose a line, drew the line along the edge that I wanted to create a buffer, hit finish, then chose the buffer option, chose side one, which is the uh, interior edge, uh, opted for three meters, rounded my corners, and then I just double checked that I'm not doing anything that's outside of my ownership. So again, this one is just slightly too big. So I'm just going to bring a dot in there and I can hold A and delete the, the dot that's um, or the vertex that I don't want. So I'm just making sure that those buffer corners are tidy, making sure that my components of my digital ecosystem are nice and healthy to keep the um, story going. So then hit subtract. You can see now I've got this ineligible area. So, so I'm building up a bit of a representation of what's happening on the ground. I'm using a combination of satellite imagery and also just knowledge of the site to um, mark off areas that are um, either ineligible or make up my digital twin. Um, and for now, that's pretty much all I wanted to draw on this basic payment project. Um, once you've done it in basic payment languages, and by the way, I'm only focusing on the, this field parcel for the demo. If you wanted to get it into UK HAB language, which is that language you're promoting for the digital twin, instead of starting from scratch, if you duplicate your basic payment into a baseline habitat assessment, so BPS to UK HAB and create plan, the land app, um, thanks to our partnership that we've been doing with the Elms trial in Gloucestershire and FWAG, et cetera, um, that we put in the BPS translation as well. So you can see that the, the Lucerne crop has um, been translated into a, a legume rich lay. Um, also within that translation, the, the, um, the ineligible features that I drew have been brought over, but because there isn't a direct translation code between ineligible feature and UK HAB, it's just an empty polygon. So as I mentioned, this is kind of a bracken, it's kind of a bracken strip that goes down the side. And within that strip is some scattered trees. Um, but again, don't, in terms of the actual language of UK HAB, Please don't worry too much about it for now. Um, we are going to be offering some UK HAB specific training in partnership with UK HAB um, in the near future. But for now, there are some online guidance sheets at ukahab.org for you to better understand that principle. What I am going to do is I'm just going to merge that bracken strip so they've got the same, um, the same codes, um, both the, the scattered trees and the, um, the primary habitat of bracken. So this is a, a digital representation of what's currently happening on the ground. So this is forming my digital twin. Um, um, what's currently happening, um, where, it's, where it is in relation to one another um, and giving it a primary code and any additional context if you need it. If there are any other features that you've forgotten to draw, you can add these to your UK HAB map as well. So that's, um, you know, for example, along the, um, edge of this field, there might be a, you know, a, a scrub, scrub corridor, for example, that you can quickly add by hitting draw, et cetera. But for now, this is our digital twin. It's just, a, it's just a detailed representation of what's currently on the ground, and it's now in the language of UK HAB. Um, for those of you that don't have a um, SBI number, don't fret. What we, what we can do is I'll just quickly do a walkthrough now of how to get to the same position, but without having a, um, an SBI number. The way you do this is you start by hitting new and you um, again use template. You can go straight into basic payment, but if you haven't got basic payment, you know, don't worry about it. You can actually just um, go straight into the baseline habitat assessment. Um, and then instead of your import mechanism or your input method being import from rural payments, you can pick from land registry. 
So what this does is this now loads all of the polygons that make up um, the land registry data set for both England and Wales. And I can choose the polygon of interest. So I've clicked on my field of Lucerne, but not only has it's highlighted this polygon and all the ownership that's contained within it, so the farm buildings, it's also included other polygons that are within the same title number. So just to show you that if I had this parcel um, within titles turned off and then select this one, it doesn't include those other blocks, this little wetland down here and this um, little triangle here um, that are under the same title number. So unless you absolutely just want one polygon, I'd keep it um, to be within the same title number because that should represent either you or your client's data better. Um, if you hit next, you then get to call it a uh, name. So this is a uh, UK Hab demo. And this is me just starting from scratch, um, trying to create a um, baseline. So you can use this um, the easy drawing tools to manually create, start fleshing out where certain habitats are. So I'm right clicking and choosing split and then manually at the moment, and I'm gonna show you how to automate this in a moment, but I'm manually creating my farm map. So before I go on my uh, farm visit, I'm just splitting this into its components, like so. And you can spend a bit more time making it neat, for example. But you can see I've quickly now got the components that make up my map. And again, like before, I can assign those the codes that are relevant to these fields. So using UK Hab, done some Lucerne, some neutral grassland. Um, and then again, I could draw that buffer strip that I had on before. What I wanted to show, however, is that that obviously on a small farm, you know, it didn't take too long. But what we have built in partnership with a number of organizations is the ability to buy a best guess baseline for that area. And what I mean is rather than you having to manually cut out those shapes for your area, we can now serve using a number of different data sets our best guess of what falls within that boundary. And so just to demonstrate that, I'm actually going to um, just create a duplicate of this and create a boundary. Actually, no, rephrase that. I'm going to actually just do that first workflow again. So I'm just going to create a new ownership boundary from land registry, choose this farm as my target and call this ownership, or this could be site boundary. I then have a, a red line boundary for my client or my farm, which has got you know red outline now. I've just made it slightly paler. This is my target area. And as a note, we have got these little T marks as well that people can use to just represent which, which side of the boundary is their farm. Um, oh, that one went a bit awry. But just as a note, this, these little, little, little icons just allow you to uh, quickly um, if you're zoomed in, you know which side of the boundary you're referring to. Um, so this, what I'm just about to show you hasn't been released yet, although if you're interested, please do get in contact. Um, this is on the development environment. So you, you probably, you eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that this was green and there's a slightly different logo at the top, but this will hopefully be released um, as soon as we've just agreed a couple of points with our partners. Um, but what you will be able to do is you'll be able to come into this new button and click the buy data. Within this by data, at the moment, you in the production element will be able to see these three workflows. So you can buy Ordnance Survey Master Map, um, RPA importing, and Wild Edges. But we want to release this one click baseline. And what this one click baseline does is it allows you to firstly define your purchase area. So I'm going to define my purchase area as ownership, which is my red line boundary. It then asks you whether you want to um, cut your features. Um, flush to the red line or are you happy for the, the habitats to spill over if say a river continued through the farm and out the other side give your plan a name demo one click um, and if you've got an sbi number you can pop it in if you haven't got an sbi number don't worry too much about it um, this just provides a bit of uh, extra detail if i then hit buy now what happens is is that red line boundary gets pushed through a number of different data layers and will output, if I refresh the screen, a UK hab map. And just to talk through the components when it loads, I'm hoping, there we are. That is now produced me a, um, a best guess of what's happening on the ground. And I want to talk through a couple of components because there's a couple of things that 
is still a guess, um, but hopefully it gives you the leg up you need. So the first thing is it's underpinned by Ordnance Survey master map. So if you notice that um, the buildings, for example, have all been um, given a UK hub code. So they've all been given the buildings UK hub code of U1B5. The, 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 um, the farm yard, so to speak, has been given its um, UK hub code and so has the gardens around the outside. Plus you've got all the different shapes that make up that master map. Um, the, the outline of the boundaries. This is actually the footpath that splits these two up. Um, it's even picked up an old, what's this? an old man-made structure of some sort. So there's quite a lot of detail in here. One thing that we're still trying to train it up on, and hence why we haven't released as well, is that I've told you just a moment ago that these two are Lucerne. The algorithm has spat out and said it's grassland. But as back to the original point, best guess, we want to just give you as a head start to go and do a survey using authoritative data. So you can quickly edit those two and actually say what they are, which in our um, demo are uh, a legume rich lay. And the other thing that this does is it compiles from government agencies data as well. So actually this block is quite an interesting one where there's actually um, priority habitat within this area and that priority habitat has been reflected in this output. So hopefully if um, everything is working, if I turn on the priority habitat and just turn this off for the moment, what you'll see is that this, this area of the um, priority habitat is deemed lowland meadows. And this bit is deemed purple moor grass and brush pastures. What the algorithm has done is it's not only extracted that information, it's also checked whether it actually believes that the, the um, priority habitat is correct. And I just wanted to show you. So these two blocks, it comes out as lowland meadows. So it agrees with Natural England that these are lowland meadows. However, it doesn't believe that this block is a lowland meadow as well, because it's got data saying that it's woodland. So actually there's, it's detected in, so to speak, a bit of an error in the Natural England's priority habitat, where you can see on satellite that this isn't all lowland meadows. It's just detected where it does believe it's lowland meadows and where it believes there's another habitat. And that's just through a series of lookups, both looking at ordnance survey and earth observation data. But this output then of best guess will hopefully then give you all you need without an SBI number, the data to go and run a, um, biodiversity offset calculation, et cetera. So those interested in that do, do get in touch. I'm probably forecasting that that's probably not gonna be live until January. We're still going through a lot of uh, bits of testing, but do get in touch if you're interested. Um, I do think it's a really powerful mechanism to at least prepare for your site visits before you go and survey in the language of uh, UK Hub. So that's creating a digital twin. Um, what we then wanna do from those digital twins is start to use the land app to articulate next steps. What is the next best thing that this far farm can do? So again, I'm just going to focus on this, um, this area of Lucerne, and I'm just going to show you how the baseline habitat assessment template relates to what we call the land management plan template. So that, hypothetically, let's say we've gone on a nice site visit. We've walked around the farm. We've had a look at data layers. So actually, let's just together look at just some key data layers that are going to inform my hypothetical scenario. First is the slopes. So I've just turned on the contour lines um, using the terrain open data. Um, and so these slopes are saying that this is 60 meters above sea level and this is 50 meters above sea level. So we've got this slope going down towards this A road down at the bottom. Um, so it's, it's on a bit of a hill. And the other one to look at is uh, the flood zones. So I want to turn on the flood zones and just understand that, you know, the, the bottom of this field is getting quite close to the Environment Agency's flood zones. So we want to be conscious not only of soil runoff, but also, you know, any leaching that might go into this um, watercourse. Um, other data layers, obviously, we've just looked at the priority habitat as well, um, which we could layer on. And another one that's relevant here is triple SIs. We are, if I actually, sorry, that's got a bit messy, priority habitat. But at least you can see that we are well within a, a kilometre of a triple SI. So we're within that one kilometre buffer zone that we're trying to protect. So I've gone on a, um, I've gone on a hypothetical site visit. I'm targeting these fields. In particular, I'm targeting this block for environmental uplift. At the moment, it's just, it's just kind of lucerne, no buffers um, uh, around the outside of the field. How do I then suggest to the landowner what they could do next? The first thing is you need to create a management plan. And to do this, you right click on the polygon of interest. So I'm right clicking on this bottom half of the, the field 
and I click copy to plan. Within the copy to plan, I can then create a new plan and that new plan is my land management plan. And I then wanna use the land management plan template. Um, I'm gonna just call it LMP demo and then create new plan. What that's done is that is now just copied. Um, it's copied the polygon, the shape of the polygon from my baseline to my land management plan, but it hasn't given it any attributes. It hasn't said what it is currently because what we now want is for you as a professional to um, articulate to the landowner what they could do here. So again, let's just get hypothetical for the moment, but one fun thing we could do is we could plant along this contour line, a hedgerow uh, or a, maybe a line of agroforestry. So you can copy the shape of that terrain onto your land management plan as well. So I've now got the shape of the contour line on my plan. And then just to tidy it up, I'm just gonna clip and delete the bits I don't want, like so clip and delete the bits I don't want and then get rid of this bit. And now here I can say, actually this contour line is a really good place for you to put a hedgerow. I've then drawn on their management plan, my first intervention that I would recommend to this landowner, put in a hedgerow or put in some form of, uh, you know, soil trapping intervention along here. I then also could maybe split the polygon. So I could, uh, I don't know, maybe in this bottom section here, add, a uh, or maybe taking it out of production might be a good thing. So at the moment, um, I think they're still ploughing in this field. Shallow ploughing might be best for actually try, trying to increase that surface roughness because we've got that slope coming down here. I on the map can then say I want to see a bit more tussocky grasses, for example. Let's establish some coxfoot. Let's let's try and make a bit of a sediment trap within here. And I'm now doodling on top of my map, or articulating what my thoughts are. Other things you can do, which are quite fun, you might want to, you know, instead of just doing a single line of hedgerow, you may want to do a double line of hedgerow. So I can you know, select that hedgerow parcel, hit duplicate, and then move, move one of those into a, a little double uh, scenario. So you can see I've just quickly doodled up on a map what I expect or suggest they should do. Um, not only can you draw it on, you can also label it with descriptions. So you could say, I don't know, sediment trap, slash tussocks, tussocky grasses, for example. So that's got tussocky, that looks about right. Um, and you can quickly then use the land app to articulate a future scenario. And obviously this doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be super clean, but this starts to build those components into the digital ecosystem of what could happen. What are you forecasting is the future. So I'm not gonna labor the point too much more, but what you can then do is obviously overlay the two. You can say, hi client, this is what you're currently doing. This is, you know, this is what the current land use is. You've got your Lucerne. But actually, we suggest on your land management plan, explore doing this. Explore putting in a double hedgerow and, you know, taking this bottom corner out of um, production and converting it into some form of sediment track, tussock grass, or it could be, you know, maybe even better, um, you know, splitting that into half and maybe doing a tussocky grass there. And then a, in here, you could do some form of scrub maybe do some, let some blackthorn natural regenerate, for example. So we've got a bit of a, um, a, a plan about what's happening. And this is just for an individual farm. But what I wanna do now is show you in the, for the final you know, 10 minutes of the demo is how these digital twins feed into that wider digital ecosystem. So the first thing to say is um, all the data is iterative, you know, just because you get involved in a digital ecosystem doesn't mean that plan is fixed. We know that you know, decisions change, the weather changes, or you know, the, the supply or demand for food changes, especially in the current climate. But what we do want to know is you know, what impact would, if my client or if I did this, what impact would that have in the wider landscape? So for our professional users, and it's worth saying that now is the point that I transition from the free software um, to the professional software. Um, for our professional users, you have access to something we call Map of Maps. Um, Map of Maps is a way of aggregating um, multiple plans, multiple digital, digital twins to visualize what they look like, where they fit next to each other. Um, the process is hopefully pretty simple. The first thing you need to do is publish a project, and that project is published by clicking this green tick, or this, sorry, this black tick next to the padlock and turning it green. And you can see the tooltip went from unpublished to now published to your organization's data layers. And the same for my land management plan demo. It says it's not yet published to your organization's data layers. I click it and it then goes published. Doesn't seem like much has happened. 
what now that has told the land app is that you want to send these two plans into your forming digital ecosystem. Um, and so at midnight every night, the land app goes and aggregates all of the plans that have that green tick and makes them available through our data layers, um, uh, our data layers uh, panel. And they sit with under they sit under this tab called organization. So opening organization, you can see that I have got all these different plans that have been published to my map of maps for me to then visualize the next one another. So just for example, all of the plans that as of midnight last night that was on baseline habitat assessment, I can toggle that on and I can not only see this client and you can see we've used this farm quite a few times. There's quite a lot of um, unhealthy ecosystem <laughs> data going in. But if I zoom out a bit, I'm hoping that because um, I'm on the development, yeah, you can see other, uh, other estates, farms that we're working with um, both locally but as i keep zooming out there should be more and more um, blue areas blocking up as well so you can start to see all this data getting compiled into that visualization in uh, in terms of what's currently happening on the ground when i'm looking at baseline um, and if i turned on my land management plan what's the proposals what are people looking to do next so that's the visualization of your your digital ecosystem who have you currently work who are you currently working with um, who's currently baselined, who's currently got a land management plan in place, even if it's just an expression of interest. One point of note is that you, um, you don't just have to sh share digital data amongst your own organization. We've built the ability for multiple organizations, whether that's a wildlife trust and a local advisory body or a, a local land agent, you can actually share one plan amongst three, five, a hundred different organizations without having to replicate or duplicate anything. And the way you do that is that the owner of the map needs to invite a single individual. So let's just say Tim is in another organization, say hypothetically a wildlife trust. Um, I could invite Tim into my map. I just need to give him access as a publisher. If I do invite Tim, my friend at the wildlife trust as a publisher and click add viewer, that then gives him permission to publish each one of my plans to their digital ecosystem as well. And why that's really important is that each individual map is hopefully going to become the one source of truth. It's going to be the place that you as an advisor work with your clients to develop a plan. And that plan can be dynamic, that baseline can update. But fundamentally, everyone who's published it is constantly at midnight getting a live copy of any changes that have made. And so that will hopefully mean that no one's left behind. No one's working off a PDF that was sent three years ago and you know, plans have changed. People's minds change. So use that publisher function, obviously with, you know, with permission of the landowner. That's really key is if you invite someone as a publisher, you're giving them permission to aggregate that data. So just make sure you've got landowner permission for that piece. But that means you know, we vis envisage that the wildlife trusts and the local councils and the farmers and the landowners can all share if they feel confident about you know, putting data into this ecosystem, can share their future plans, can share that vision so we can start to see what, you know, what the future might hold, what it might look like, how things are being connected. That's the, that's the spatial overview. So Map of Maps really key for that, using Collaborate and publisher permissions. Um, to understand and visualize what you're, um, what you're wanting to do next. What I wanted to now show you is what are the things that we're building in the background that's gonna help that premise. And in just a bit of Blue Peter fashion, um, I'm just gonna go to a, um, it says, let me just go to my uh, demo map just to show you what good looks like for five minutes. So hypothetically, this is my hometown of Royal Wolf and Bassett. Um, I've done a hypothetical um, BNG assessment, just to show you how the, the new functionality of Land App is hopefully going to speed up your process. I've defined a boundary. I then purchased my best guess baseline, and I confirmed and amended that best guess baseline. You know, I, I, I improved the habitat classification, like I've given these modified grassland codes, hypothetically said some of this was neutral grassland, and also up here was a bit of lowland calcareous. But in my hypothetical situation, I've said that I want to build a development here, but I want to do some in um, on-site offsetting. Um, so I've created a bit of a plan and I've used that same principle that I've just shown you to draw on top of this where I, where I want to do some different things. So in my hypothetical situation, I want to um, create some new buildings and do the development along this northern edge. I then also want to improve the quality of these grasslands from, um, what were they before? 
um, from from fairly good to good, I think. I know that one's staying the same. From this one is going from fairly good to good. Um, and I'm also doing a bit of woodland creation as well. So I'm planting some new woodland, I'm restoring grassland. All of those things feed into my biodiversity unit calculation. Now, um, by publishing that data, by clicking this baseline um, publish and land management publish, I now am sending data not only to my map of maps, but to my new metrics dashboard that is hopefully going to be released again in January. But I'd like to just give you a quick demo of it. So it sits within um, your data layers section. So you should be able to recognize plans and data layers. We're hopefully going to release a metrics dashboard. And what this metrics dashboard allows you to do is not only visualize your map of maps or your organization's ecosystem, but also start to quantify what that represents. So literally the site I just shown you, you can see I've got an interactive map for my site. It's breaking down that site by area. So you can see the total hectares. Um, and it's also doing the ratios of existing condition assessments, for example. Um, within that, there's also a tab called future. And this is now a future vision of this site. Um, one main thing that you probably would have noticed is that my future vision is 100% coverage. Whereas when I was doing those land management plans, I was just picking out the specific areas of interest. And what we do in the processing of that data is we clip the two together. If there's nothing changed in the baseline, e.g. there's nothing on top of it on the land management plan, it remains the same. If there is a polygon on top of it, we clip it together and we replace the baseline with the land management plan. So this now is a future vision of my uh, area um, and the, the, uh, the, the, um, the dashboard automatically summarizes some key areas. So for example, I'm creating 14 hectares of new habitat. I'm enhancing 21 hectares of uh, new habitat. And actually there's no change um, for a percentage of this. Um, but the key thing to show you that if you put your data in, a, in, in that format, not only can we start deriving these high level numbers, we can now start to um, forecast the impact on your biodiversity units. Um, and so that's why it's really, really key as we prepare to release this, that you start to follow this process of a clean baseline, what's currently happening on the ground in the language of UK Hab, and a clean scenario about what could happen in the future. We can start to tie in metrics like the biodiversity unit estimator we've got in here. So for my hypothetical situation I just showed you, the on-site baseline was 133 units. Once I've completed all my interventions on site, I can get up to 167, and therefore I am achieving my 10% uplift that I was trying to achieve. So in, in this one, I'm what, creating 34 units. Therefore, uh, on this site, I don't need to, hypothetically, I don't need to offset to do my development as providing that the surveying said I was actually in poor condition grassland and I'm going to good condition. And also those um, habitats that we're creating are um, suitable. These are the tools that we believe are going to empower you as a sector. It's going to quickly be able to appraise different customers. You'll be able to quickly get your baseline set up, an easy to use tool to start drawing those plans. And once we get it all, that digital ecosystem set up, you can start to derive some real insight across your organization. And so this is obviously just looking at that one plan. But if I wanted to compare you know, that plan with another one of my demos, I mean, I'm not sure who's going to be on here, but you can, you can and we, we're going to do a session nearer the time, but you can filter the data and just look at particular um, particular farms. Um, let's go Ashton Court, Bristol, because it's literally just, just around the corner from where I am. But you can quickly appraise different clients, different projects on their impact on, say, biodiversity units um, if it loads. But again, this is still a bit of a demo, so it might be a bit slow. There we are. So yeah, I've got a map that shows the... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I've got headline results for the plan that someone in my organization has done around Ashton Court. Our hypothetical plan can start achieving some serious units as well. Okay. So, the so for the final two minutes before we come on to um, Q&A, just to show you what good looks like, we will be sharing this slide with everyone, is that we fundamentally think that every management unit in the country should try and get a map that looks like this, which includes an ownership boundary, a farm infrastructure map, which shows where their existing gates, water pipes are, et cetera. Um, and we recommend you do that on the blank template. Then on top of that, if you're a farm, your basic payment scheme and your countryside stewardship, um, obviously this is just farm relevant, but for everyone, we really want people to get a UK Hab baseline, a digital twin of what's currently happening in the language of UK Hab, 
with all existing features, both polygons and lines, all your hedgerows, et cetera. And then on top of that, a proposed management plan. What do you want to do in the future? Or what does your client want to do into the future for that given area? Those two data layers then give us all the information we need to start justifying uplift, deriving metrics, et cetera. Last point before we do q and A. I've seen there's a couple of ones that have come through, is our mobile app is due for release in January 2023. I've had a play, I've got it on my phone, it's very exciting. Um, at the moment, you can do in-field measurements, you can um, upload photos, GPS positioning, and view satellite imagery. And as we develop more, um, there'll be um, obviously new releases to come. Just a note that beta testing has begun, or you um, will hear about it um, in the near future. But anyone who wants to be part of the beta testing will get 50% off for the first three months of the mobile app. Um, and they obviously get to play with it before anyone else. So do drop us a message um, if you're interested in testing the mobile app. Tom, my friend, over to you to come and host the Q&A. Um, and anyone else who's got any questions, wants to stir a discussion, please do. Um, thanks for listening. Um, Tom.